<laughs> no, you don't need. We got a minute to go, uh, or half a minute. <laughs> Bob uh, and Ruth are doing the Zoom call today, so thanks be to God. Bless them. Uh, so anyway, okay, we're about ready to go. Let's go ahead and pray. Go ahead and record. Ready? Okay. Father, we enter your presence consciously, Lord, because you are living in us by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. We declare that Jesus is Lord, that you have died for us. Your blood was shed to cleanse us from our sins, to break the power of the enemy and all the work of the devil. You rose from the dead, and you are now reign and rule at the Father's right hand, and we declare you are Lord over all. You are Lord over us and over this place. And so we pray as we come to this subject today, we thank you that we are confident and joyful in you, and we do pray, Lord, even as your word says, let God arise. And let his enemies be scattered. Let them flee from before him. Let them melt away like wax and blow away like the chaff in the wind. We bless you, praise you. And we do thank you for the authority and power that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that authority and power, we bind the enemy. We bind Satan and any and every work, blinding, hindering, opposing. Lord, cleanse us, we pray. We cut loose from any access of the enemy, close all the doors. And we just open up our lives, our hearts to you now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, come Holy Spirit, lead, guide, and direct. And we ask, give us understanding, revelation, even transformation to be living in the real world, uh, Lord, that is in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I think probably most everybody knows we're uh, we're beginning a brief series, and when I say brief, it's right now it's going to be, Lord willing, four Sundays. We're looking at Satan, he's real, what Satan does next week. The week after that, demons are real, and what demons do. And so uh, we're looking at the kingdom of Satan, and as I say, the dark side of the world that we live in. All of us live in a world that is real. We don't live actually in a fantasy world. People's minds can, uh, you know, I mean, sadly, I remember when I, before I became a Christian, was in the hippie movement, you know, I heard stories about people on drugs. I took LSD too. But, you know, <laughs> they, you know, they jump off a building and they think they could fly. All right. Well, you're not living in the real world. Uh, you, you're going to hit the real world sooner or later. We live in that real world. Uh, that exists, not a fantasy world. And so what is the real? The real world reality is the world Jesus lives in, all right? How do we know what is real? It's the mind of God, the mind of Christ, who the Lord Jesus is. I can go into a lot of that, but fundamentally, the theological principle is he is the logos, meaning everything is created according to his mind, will, purpose to accomplish his will. But it's revealed in the Word of God, the more we believe in, understand, and live in the world Jesus lives in, the world that is revealed in the Bible, the more we will be living in the real world and in reality, according to reality. Insanity is just simply being out of touch with understanding of who God is, Jesus, and living in his world. Now, the Bible reveals that the real world is one in which the invisible spiritual realm influences, interfaces, and impacts the visible earthly realm. And in the created time, space, invisible realm, there exist actual spiritual beings. Now, this is technical language. I'll just say this caveat that uh, the spiritual beings, holy angels or demons or the devil himself, can manifest. All right, so you are... We are created with physical eyes and a spiritual heart, one way or another, but it can become visible to us if God makes it or allows it to happen. If you remember, uh, Elisha the prophet said, greater those with us and those that are against us, and the whole hills around him them were filled with angelic beings. So he saw them, all right? But for the most part, it's an invisible world. And when I say time-space, 
they exist in a created order of time space. All right. It, and it just happens to be another realm. You look at this phone here. Okay. What is, what interfaces with it? Something that's real. Okay. We may not see it, but it actually exists in time space reality. It can, there can be a radio wave that goes from here to that satellite goes all over the world. It can take, you know, who knows? I mean, it goes whatever the speed of electricity is, but it's still limited time space that happens. All right. Now, God is a spirit. His throne is in heaven, the third heaven, which radiates with the glory, wonder, and splendor of his holy manifest presence. And I use this word in, in uh, basically quotes, angelic, because people use different words for the spiritual beings that live in this invisible realm. But I think categorically we can say they're angelic beings. All right, now this is a general statement, just like we're human beings. They are angelic beings. And in that realm, these angelic beings have many, there are many varieties and kinds. Some of us, you know, you know, there's cherubim, there's seraphim, uh, and many other kind of angelic beings. Now, there are two classes or kinds in this sense of angelic beings. Holy angelic beings who are confirmed before God in their love and loyalty to God. They're committed to worship and obey God to carry out their assignments from him to accomplish his will in the universe, wherever that is. And because of this, they are members of the kingdom of God. They live in according to the rule of God. And there are unholy angelic beings who long ages ago chose to sin and rebel against God, and they became confirmed in their fallen nature as evil enemies of God and utterly opposed to his will. This means they cannot be saved. Okay, they will not be saved. They're under eternal condemnation by God. Now, from the time of the so-called enlightenment, and if you study world history, and I talk about it sometimes, but they call it the enlightenment, but it wasn't Christians who gave it that title. It was non-Christians. And it's the time of the enlightenment is really the beginning of endarkening of the Western world. So in the 17th and 18th centuries, which, and this is a key thing, rejected the word of God, the revelation from God in scripture, the Western world. Okay. And again, it's the Western world uh, gradually adopted a worldview that emptied life and the universe from the reality of the spirit realm. Now, probably the best way that it, this is described is to say, are we alone in the universe? Okay, where does that work? Where does that come from? It doesn't come from the rest of the world. The rest of the world never thinks we're alone in the universe. They've worshipped spirits from for centuries, millennia. They know there are other things. It's the Western world that philosophically, ideologically emptied the the world we live in from the spirit realm. And so you come to this place where it's not real. It's the superstition, fantasy, or or whatever. But the problem is, is that Western Christians, for the most part, have lived in that Western worldview. All right. Now, we can confess we believe the Bible. You know, you even you talk about the devil, things like that. But what I say here, for the most part, uh, <clears throat> as a result of this, Western Christians, while they profess to believe the Bible, do not live in a world that they understand the reality of the spirit realm, the actions of the spirits and Holy Spirit as much as any, but angelic beings and primarily demons. We know, or they know, knew or know little or nothing, and this is the important thing, about the practical reality of Satan. Okay, and I'm not talking about you read in your Bible, yeah, I believe in the devil, okay, or stuff like that. It said, you just don't live in a world where the devil exists and unless you blame it on him for some stupid thing you did, all right? <laughs> but, you know, the practical reality of spiritual warfare, of interfacing and attack from the enemy, understanding deliverance, the power of deliverance, understanding the authority and power that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. These are things that many Christians just don't really understand. 
okay, because of the worldview. Now, the reality of the actual personal spiritual being, Satan, and his kingdom was and continues to be right now a reality in the life of Jesus. And it's seen in numerous places, just too many to name in here. But these include, for example, Jesus' own personal encounter with Satan in his temptations. We read that, people go, okay, you read that, but it's, it's almost like reading once upon a time, all right, instead of this is actual history, okay? We study history, what happened, uh, you know, June 6th, 1943, what happened? I mean, 44, 44, dating, historic, actual events, all right? And Jesus historically encountered the person of Satan. Jesus taught us to pray about the kingdom of Satan in the Lord's Prayer, the deliver us from evil. He spoke about Satan and his kingdom in his own teaching, in the parables, and he revealed that one of the expressed purposes of him dying and rising was to fulfill God's prophetic word in Genesis 3.15. If you're familiar with Genesis 3.15, that's the very first word of prophecy that God gave after the fall, where God decreed and foretold that the one born of the woman would crush the head. That means the, the kingdom, the rule, the dominion of Satan. And of course, it says Satan would uh, bruise his heel, which is his crucifixion. Now, the reality of Satan and the influence, his influence in history in the history of the human race is seen in scripture from the very beginning of human history that's in the first book of Genesis all the way through until the end of the age. And when I say that, what I mean by that is ages in history are sequential and linear, but there are different uh, characteristics. Now, at, in chapter 20 of Revelation, you have the, the end of the heaven and the earth as we know it. Chapter 21 begins a new heaven and new earth. So when I'm talking about that, it's to that period of history. Now, Genesis 3 reveals that after God culminated his creation of the heavens and the earth with Adam and Eve being given rule over the earth, Satan came and spoke to them through the serpent, tempting them to sin against God. Now, I think probably all of us are familiar with this, the very first verse of chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that Yahweh, the Lord God, had created or made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, many people don't know this, states that while Satan deceived Eve, Adam willfully chose to believe his lies instead of the word of God and acted to sin against God by disobeying his command. I used to say Satan deceived Adam and Eve. The Bible doesn't say Adam was deceived. His sin was greater, more culpable, and more evil. He knew what he was doing, and he chose not to believe what God said, but to believe the devil. Uh, this was the turning point of human history with the fall of Adam into sin, you can read about that in Romans 5, and the consequence uh, that rule over the earth, which had been given Adam and Eve, and, and rule over the human race was taken over by Satan. As a result, the Bible now speaks of Satan as, quote, literally, the ruler of this world. That's what Jesus called him. He is the God of this age, meaning the superior spiritual being that is falsely worshipped this time in history. He's the prince and power of the air. Prince means not second in command, is you know, like coming from England, you have the king and then the prince. In the Bible, prince means the principal authority. Okay, you go to a school, you have the principal, that's the person in charge. That's what it means there. He's the king. He's the prince, the power literally, that functions in the air. That means it's the, the realm of the atmosphere, the spiritual atmosphere that exists. He is uh, working in the sons of disobedience. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to destroy or devour. And this, the Bible says, the whole world lies in his power. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning 
and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks out of his own nature. Literally, it's his own, meaning what he is. And so it's character or his nature, his being. For he is a liar and the father of lies. And his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, the Bible reveals that according to God's sovereign purpose, plan, and providence. We can ask why. God bless you <clears throat> if you want to ask why. But you might get the same answer that God gave Job. <clears throat> Do you know how I run the universe? No, I don't. <laughs> you know, so God said, well, you won't understand this. But <clears throat> the sovereign purpose, the plan, and providence of God is that he permitted Satan to be God's supreme enemy and adversary, to have dominating, oppressive, and deadly influence and rule in the course of human affairs. All of human history, with its death, disease, disasters, destruction, its woes, wars, problems, pain, broken hearts, broken relationships, broken lives, is a record and testimony that the reality behind the actions of human beings is the spiritual power of Satan, who influences, interacts, and impacts the lives of every person, every person on earth with the intention to kill and destroy and ultimately lead people to eternity separated from God. Anybody read the newspaper? Anybody watch the news? Anybody read history? That is a record of the power of Satan working in and through humanity. Satan will continue to do so until the time appointed by God for his ultimate doom when he will be cast into that place Jesus spoke of as, quote, the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil, the lake of fire that is called hell. And the revelation speaks of that he's thrown in the lake of fire. Now, Satan knows he's doomed. Okay. The demons know they're doomed. You remember when Jesus showed up at the, um, the, the guy that had as many demons as you could think of, a legion of demons. The demons spoke to Jesus, have you come now to destroy us? Okay, they didn't go, okay, we're going to fight against you. We're not going to. They knew they were under the judgment of God. In Scripture, there are various names and titles given to Satan that identify who, what he is, and what he does. And again, there may be up to 50 or uh, 40 different names, excuse me, and titles that in one way or another refer to him. These are just a few, probably the ones that we're most familiar with. The devil. The devil is a title and means literally the slanderer. He seeks to destroy the reputation, the character, uh, the honor of people by lying against them, accusing them. He's the evil one. That means his nature. He is evil. He's the tempter. This describes his methodology to bring about evil. He's a serpent, coming from Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And it alludes to the crafty wisdom and skill that he has. Satan has been working for thousands of years. He knows what he is doing. He knows people. He knows human nature. I've heard stories, for example, of people who were in the occult, who knew exactly the weaknesses of people in Christian uh, leadership or other Christians. They know what they are doing. If you do warfare, the most important thing that you do, first of all, is what's called intelligence. Where's the weak spot? What's the strategy? That's just exactly what Satan does. It's not like he goes, anyway, I don't need to go into that. But he knows what he's doing. Now, the great dragon, which alludes to the primordial serpent, form of the creature that God, I mean, that Satan possessed in the garden and was cursed by God. Okay, now, I don't want to go into it, but notice what God said to Satan, or I mean to the serpent, which he said, you will walk now, crawl on your belly. Why? Because it had legs. I believe that the form of that serpent originally was a dragon, what we would call a dragon. Okay, but it was cursed. But nevertheless, it became the idolatrous form of wisdom, given by Satan and specifically worship to Satan. Has anybody ever noticed how much dragons are more and more and more and more coming into our culture? Cartoons, 
movies, they become China is that's they worship the dragon. That's what their God, their primary God is a dragon. All over the world, dragons are the symbol of wisdom and, and what is worshiped. And that's really the idolatrous form of Satan. He's the accuser of the brethren, which identifies his prosecuting role in the court of heaven and his slanderous lying methodology to attack the righteous. That's what he does. We just saw a trial. Some of you probably are familiar with that. Certain data came before and certain judgments were made. But just think of that trial. Then <clears throat> he's called uh, Satan, which means the adversary, the name and title used most often by him in scripture. It's used 52 times, that one title. Think of this. Michael is only named five times. Gabriel, four times. Satan, 52. He is real. Jesus, when he spoke to this being, called him Satan. Now, in the English-speaking culture, he's often called Lucifer. How many, obviously, most of us have heard of that. There's TV programs now after Lucifer. He's com this is commonly believed to be his original, and notice, personal name. Because all those other things are titles, okay? They're all titles. They're adversary, accuser, tempter. They are all titles of what he is and what he does. He has a personal name, just like Michael has a personal name. Gabriel has a personal name. But it's not Lucifer. Okay, the name Lucifer comes from the English translation of Isaiah 14, 2. And I'm not saying you can't call him Lucifer, okay? I'm not saying that. Don't get that on my But I'm saying that's not his original personal name. It comes from the uh, Isaiah 14, 12, the Hebrew, which they translated, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, Lucifer is actually Latin, all right? And it means light bearer, the bearer of light. Loose, light, fair is bare. And I'll just say this. If you ever heard of the Illuminati, okay, that comes from Lucifer. They worship Lucifer as a true ultimate God. Depends on different theologies that they have, but they are illumined by the light of Lucifer. In the Hebrew Isaiah 14, 12, his person name is actually Hillel, which means shining one. This is why Paul wrote of him, Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. All right? That's what he was created as. Now, while the Bible does not make known the date in history of the universe for the fall of Hillel to become Satan, the Bible does give some revelation of the reality of who he was before his fall, his God-given attributes, and his inevitable doom. All right, it's in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19. Now, <clears throat> when you look at that text, and this is what's important, God is addressing a being identified as, quote, the king of Tyre. So he's the power behind Tyre. And as is evident in what God says, he's not addressing a human ruler. This person could not be a human being that he's talking about. He's addressing a spiritual being, a ruler who is and became Satan. Now, I'm not going to read that passage because we, I have specific delineation of what it says. Now, <clears throat> it's because these words cannot be about a human king that they are rightly understood to be a revelation about Satan with many, I think, probably to us, interesting and informative things. First of all, this is most important. Verse 13, 15, God says, on the day you were created, the day you were created, two times. This is a place to begin, all right? And whenever you think about Satan, always think he's a created being, first of all, okay? Created by God. Well, his supreme motivating desire is to be like God and to make people think he is, to have authority and power like God and to be worshiped as God. God alone, whose name is Yahweh. Do you know what Yahweh comes from, the name Yahweh? It basically means the living one, the one who is self-existence, the one who is eternally existing. He is the living one. Yahweh is his personal name. 
Lord is a title. Okay, I can go into all that. He's a holy one, all these things. But his personal name is Yahweh because that's who he is. He's the only being who is self-existing and, uh, and the I am. Being a creation of God, Satan's existence is totally dependent on God's almighty sustaining power. All right? He may appear as, and he is, has great authority and power, but everything that he does is dependent upon God continuing to sustain him in his existence. Just like us. God pulls the plug, where do we go? We're nothing. All right? We exist because of God. All right? The power of God. Satan and all those beings, everything exists because of God. Now, two important things because of this. Being a creation of God, Satan's existence is totally dependent on God. And like every other create, created being, is finite. What does finite mean? Limited. He's got time-space dimensions. All right? He's limited to time-space. So that means he can only be in one place. Somebody asked me uh, before I began, is Satan omnit, you know, on the present? Is he everywhere? No, he's not. The Bible speaks of him roaming the earth like a lion. He's only one place, one time. Okay, that's where he is. And then B, he's limited in his wisdom and knowledge, and specifically what is hidden by God. Now, Satan has enormous wisdom, enormous intelligence enormous wealth of background, of knowledge and skill, all right? But he's limited. He's only a finite creature with limited thoughts. And the key thing the Bible reveals, you can see it, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where God, uh, through Paul, is saying God has hidden his wisdom, okay, that it's not revealed to the rulers of the world, which is Satan and the demonic powers. Why? Because if they had known what they would do by crucifying Jesus, that that very act destroyed their power, they would not have done that. All right? But that wisdom is hidden, was hidden by God. And so what God does is hidden as he desires from the devil, okay, until the time that God wants to reveal it. So he's limited in that. Uh, turn the page to two. Is that where we're at? Yep. Uh, on page four. Uh, the second thing, God says to him, you were an anointed guardian cherub. Guardian cherub, he says that twice. Now, cherub is a class, a type of angelic being. Again, remember, there's seraphim, there's those that are called angels, messengers. There's all different kinds of, of uh, uh, angelic beings. They are a kind of angelic being who is assigned to be the guardian, that's what God says, of God, closest to the throne of God, as is depicted in the design, design of the tabernacle and temple. If you're familiar with that, you know, embroidered in the veil is the angelic beings along the walls are angelic beings, but what's over the Ark of the Covenant? Cherubim. All of those cherubim are there guarding God, God himself, his glory, the, and so being now, again, the anointed, this is technical biblical language. In one sense, we're all anointed by the Holy Spirit. But the anointed in the Bible means the highest ranking. The chief priest was called the anointed priest. All right. The king, David started calling, you know, uh, Saul the anointed because he's the highest ranking uh, ruler in the government. All right, so being anointed, the anointed cherub, he was the highest ranking guardian of God and his throne, having the highest authority, leadership, privilege, and responsibility over all the cherubim, and im is plural for Hebrew, okay? Usually you will sing cherubim or cher cherubim, but it's im, I'm just saying that for if you want to sing it or not. And because of this, the ranking authority over all angelic beings. Okay, this is what the scripture is showing. He's the highest created angelic being uh, that there was at that time. <clears throat> Number three, he, the signet of perfection. Now, literally, this means the sealing of the pattern or design. Now, this means that as Adam and Eve were the culmination of God's human design being made in the image of God, this one who is Halal 
was the culmination of the design of God, of the kind of angelic being God created him to be. All right, now contrast that, for example, of what we got going on in our culture with transgender, all this stuff. I am who I want to be. You know, and you're constantly changing it, whatever the whims are, whatever the demons are saying in you. All right, God created us for a purpose, a design, an environment, a calling, a, a, an assignment, a purpose, ultimately for us to be like Jesus. Glory to God. Now, he was the culmination of this, and this uh, has a cherub uh, and ruling spirit in the angelic realm. Four, full of wisdom. Now, full is a biblical word that, that connotes fullness. In the Bible, fullness means something that's real it's there i think if you remember when i was talking about being filled with the holy spirit you have a glass it's empty you pour something into it water there's real water that fills that glass until it be overflows the fullness comes now fullness in this sense means really the presence of god okay it's not an abstract idea it's not just a guy that knows how to you know do things here. Uh, he's filled with the presence of God and wisdom in the Bible, okay, is the fear of God and the knowledge of God and his ways. All right, again, we become totally secularized when we look at wisdom. You know, there is wisdom of the world. The devil has wisdom. You can have wisdom, whatever, how to build something, how to invest in the stock market, how to whatever. Okay, these are horizontal things. In the Bible, the fundamental definition of wisdom is God, knowing God, God's ways, the fear of God's living in the world that God has created to please God, to do his will and do what is right. So he's full of the knowledge of God and the ways of God. Now, again, just think about that. How does he have great skill and craft? Because he knows what to do. This comes to my mind. Um, I'll, I'll give you this thought. Years ago, uh, the people that wanted to run the world, the globalists, this was in 1773. I'm not going to give you a name, but just think about it. Gather together all the, the wealthiest people in the world. And he said, we can control the world if we control the wealth. This is a meeting in 1773. This person had a plan, which is actually transpiring now. But he said this. He says, we are going to win. Why? Because our enemies are moral. Being moral is their great weakness. Okay? Just think what's going on in our world today. All right? Now, just think of a football game. If you have one team that is moral and plays according to the rules, and the other team that's constantly cheating because all they care about is the end, they bribe the refs because all they care about is the end, who's going to have to me win that game? <laughs> the cheaters, the people that are corrupt. But here's the truth. Who's on the throne? God. God is on the throne. God is the righteous moral being who will bring everything to judgment on the day of judgment and give, and everybody will give an account. So, number five, <clears throat> perfect in beauty. Now, the word perfect in the Hebrew means whole. Okay, this is an attribute of holiness. You're whole, all right? Um, you can go into it, but what is what is something that's beautiful? It's basically that which is in proportion. It's whole, it's not marred, okay? When you look at, let's say, statues that the Greeks did of human beings, you know, you have these beings that were proportionate. There's something beautiful. If you went up and marred it, like the uh, activists who went into the Louvre, I think, and uh, damaged the Monet painting. All right, there's a real winner, isn't it? Anyway, but there is something important about beauty, okay, that's whole. And it having the qualities of form, colors that bring pleasure and includes all these, you know, uh, jewels, just amazing things. And again, if you think of that's weird, it's only because you don't know. <laughs> You know, we see animals all over the world that you look at them, you go, what in the world? It's only because we don't understand it. But think about the earthly realm. Uh, we were uh, over in uh, Truman and Mary Lois's house the other day, and they had a painted bunting. Have you ever seen a painted bunting? 
it's like, this is an amazing bird, all these colors. You can't help but look at it. Think about, if you've ever seen shows in nature, you know, they show uh, the, all the butterflies, 20,000 different uh, kinds of butterflies, variegated colors, the fish in the sea, the tropical fish all over the world. You, you, you can't help but go, look at that. And when something is beautiful, it is attractive, all right? You know, it's attractive and it can become very fascinating. And I think these are important words to speak of Satan. Satan is one way beautiful. He is fascinating. Evil is fascinating. Evil is intriguing, all right? And it's, attra and it's tra attractive, and that's what lures people in. Number six, you are blameless in your ways. God created him righteous and holy. Now, I didn't put this in here, but what's absolutely critical for something to be in the presence of God, you see this in the sacrifice, was that it be without blemish or blameless. So the only reason Satan or Hillel at that time could be in the presence of God is because he's blameless. He's without pollution, corruption, or filth. God created him that way. And of course, he could create him no other way because God can't create something that's flawed or evil. Seven. Now this gets into interesting stuff. Okay, most people aren't aware of it. But you were in Eden, the garden of God. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. Okay, now these are statements about earthly Eden, the garden of Eden. That's what he said. All right, and it's the mountain of God. Now, in the scripture, mountain is the place of rule. Um, okay, that's why Satan took Jesus to a high mountain, the high mountain, and offered him the kingdoms of the earth. All right, when you look at, like, let's say, prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2, in the last days, latter days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be above every other hill, and meaning the, the true religion of God will be ruling on the earth over every other false religion that ever is. So Eden was the capital of God. Eden, does anybody know what Eden, by the way, means? But it means place of pleasure, delight. Isn't that cool? Forget Disneyland, I'm going to Eden. <laughs> All right, so he, <clears throat> he was assigned to Eden and the Garden of Eden. Now, of course, this is not some king of Tyre if he's talking about Genesis chapter one, you know, two and three. All right, <clears throat> where the throne and manifest presence of God was. Now, remember, in chapter four, too, if you're familiar with, you know, Cain and Abel are there. Cain kills Abel. What is what happens? God calls Cain to Himself, and He's speaking to him right there. Now, have you ever read that and you go, "Oh, what's going on here?" Well, there was an actual locality on Earth. That's where God's presence was. That's where His throne was on Earth. All right, so He came there. Now, this is important, too. <clears throat> he seems, and I just put that word seems, I think it really was. I just said that for a, you know, wiggle room. Uh, to have been the angelic guardian spirit over Eden. All right? Most people don't, but if you think, for example, how many cities have patron spirits or patron saints? Okay, those are spirits over a locality. Charleston has a patron spirit over it that it was dedicated to, which is basically a demon. Anyway, I'll just say that. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, God created thrones and dominions. All right, so these angelic beings are ruling spirits. These are the sons of God, by the way, in the scripture. That's a class of ruling spirit. They are given assignments by God, and they have places of rule. Satan's assignment, as it says here, was in Eden. All right, now, how did he show up at, at you know, chapter three in the, in the serpent? Did he just go, there he is, you know, what's going on? He was already there. All right, now, Adam didn't do his role to guard the place, but here is the enemy able to access this created being. Now, again, that might seem weird to us, but this is the power of the spirit realm, all right? Spirits can speak through people. Spirits can speak through 
Donkeys, have you ever heard of that one? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so he, quote unquote, possessed the serpent and was speaking through it. <clears throat> Number eight, till unrighteousness was found in you and you sinned, your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, were filled with violence. Now this reveals that becoming proud in his heart and I'll just say this, proud is a secondary manifestation of the first sin, ultimately. What is the first sin? It's to stop believing God. When you stop believing God, you have to rely on something else, either some other created being or yourself. All right. And so you become proud. He did. Because of who... who and what God made him in his beauty, wisdom, splendor, and he sinned and was filled with evil, unrighteousness, uh, and unrighteousness with his nature, corrupted, and his, and his God-given wisdom now being used to do evil and commit acts of violence. And I put that there. The Hebrew word that's most often translated violence is the word Hamas. Does anybody ever know what heard of Hamas? That's what the Hebrew word that means violence is. It's Hamas. This is one of the great mysteries and realities of life. You know, the problem of evil. Where did it come from? The Bible does not reveal <clears throat> the metaphysical or ontological. Okay, those are technical words. That means how it actually happened in the material, real world. Okay, God doesn't reveal that. How does a creature created good, righteous, holy by God become evil? The Bible doesn't talk about that. It just simply says that it happened. All right. <clears throat> Offering. Okay. So he became evil. Uh, the Bible uh, describes his actions as a re this action as a result or the origin and root of all sin and evil in the universe. Now, this is a quote from Genesis but the terrible reality of the earth being filled with violence began here. Okay. This, it began with Satan. <clears throat> now, we've got a few, not very much. But uh, number 16, the abundance of your trade and multitude of your in iniquities and unrighteousness, your trade. Now, this is important, this word trade. Trade is a negotiation process. Offering something in return to the angelic beings, he deceived them to follow him in his rebellion against God, in which they literally sold their souls to Satan for what he offered to give them. And one third of the angelic beings followed. All right. That still goes on. Okay. Many people in the highest authorities have sold their soul to soul Satan. In entertainment ministry, I mean, uh, areas, I don't want to call it ministry, whatever. Okay, and they, they sold themselves to the devil, literally, they say it. The result was the corruption, defilement, and sinful pollution of the environment of those sanctuaries or holy places of God-given rule and dominion that those angelic spirits possessed. Have you ever read this place, this word, word, word in Jude? Angels, that means those who were holy, did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. <clears throat> All right, this is where they sinned. <clears throat> beginning with Adam and Eve, this is what Satan has done through history. It's what Jesus has offered by him. That was the ultimate, <clears throat> the ultimate temptation. Worship me, and I'll give you authority and power over all those kingdoms and their glory. Now, the prophetic example of this is the great whore prostitute harlot of Babylon. If you ever read Revelation chapter 17 and 18, chapter 18 is not the Catholic Church. It's a total economic globalist uh, entity. It is, I believe, world globalism, the world economic forum. That's what's going on in the world. If you wonder why, how could these people, you look in the news, how come this is happening? If you have the right understanding or right filter, you know and understand why these decisions are being made. All right. I won't go into more detail, but it has to do with ultimately with Satan the purpose of Satan to bring about the ultimate rule of Satan upon the earth. Okay, and then the last is his judgment. All right, this is a future judgment. 
I don't have time to go into that, but it just says he was cast out and ultimately he will come to a dreadful end. He's on his way to hell. Lastly, and this is important, we want to end with this. How do we deal with the devil? How do we approach it? First of all, be serious. Okay, be serious and sober about the reality of Satan, but do not fear him. All right, it's a sin to fear Satan. All right, I'm saying that, and I'll say it next week, Lord willing. It's a sin to fear Satan. You are to be uh, aware, understand, but not fear because we trust in God. If we are living in submission to God in his will, purposes, we have authority against the devil. And the Bible literally says he will flee. Trust, believe in the power of the blood of Jesus before God against all the accusations of Satan. When you sin, you're guilty. The devil will come and accuse you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb. Publicly confess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by word and how you live. They conquered him by the word of their testimony. Be unyielding in your faith and confidence in the authority, power of the sovereign God, the resurrected, ascended, and reigning Lord Jesus Christ, and the almighty power of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and is far greater. Greater is he in you than he is in the world. Five, put on the full armor of God. And I think we're, we're familiar with that, to be able to stand against the schemes and methods of the devil. This is important. Number six, wage war against him through prayer. All right, Christians don't pray enough. I'll just say this. The primary battlefield is prayer. Now, this is the last one. I want to emphasize this. I don't hear this very often. Be willing to be martyred and die for the Lord Jesus because you love him more than your own life and believe that just as he was raised from the dead, you, so you will be also because in and through faith alone in him, you were given the free gift of eternal life. All right, they conquered him because they did not love their lives even to death. And just close in these wonderful words translated from the German and the English and Martin Luther, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We worship you. And I just pray in the name of Jesus, release revelation, transformation to be living in the real world by the power and presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>